your shopping done by today? Did everybody that was going to shop, did you shop? I, uh, yeah, I, did. I got some things arrived today. I kept getting Amazon saying we can't deliver it because the wind, I guess, would blow it off the porch. And so I thought, is it going to come? But it finally came today, and that was good. Um, Ethan stopped by the house the other day, and he said, what are you getting, Jane? And I said, you know, I'm thinking this year I'm just going to wrap myself in wrapping paper, and I'm going to put a bow on my head. And he said, without blinking an eye, he said, yeah, I'm not giving Rachel much this year either. Um, so I don't know. <laughs> I thought I'd get a little different response about that. Um, <laughs> David is not here, but I saw Marsha over here. It's not that. No, no yeah. Uh, Marsha Hood is over there. And uh, David told me a couple of days ago that their cre her credit card got stolen. And I said, did you turn it into the police? He said, absolutely not. The thief is spending way less than Marsha has been spending. So uh, they're not turning it in. So that's very, very good. I know those are corny jokes, but I just wanted to share them with you. How about food? Are you eating good? Everybody that wants to eat healthy, I hope you can get back on track. But we're not really paying any attention to it right now. We're eating everything, and it is wonderful. I wanted to look at some pictures of some of you when you were kids. And at Christmas time, I thought that might be interesting. So we will take a peek. Anybody know who this precious little girl is right here? Anybody? Would you believe it is our own Tamika? Isn't she beautiful? That's very good, Tamika. And I fell in love with this little girl with those beautiful pigtails. Anybody want to take a guess? That looks to me like that could be Kylie Joe, who's sitting right over here. That's wonderful. Anybody know this cute kid? Well, his name is Ethan Waters, and he was just playing the piano just a minute ago. Then this fine-looking young gentleman, anybody remember him? It's Denzel Washington. I mean, Herb Farabee. I'm sorry, Herb Farabee. We always say he looks like Denzel. How about this good-looking young man? Y'all know, right? He was playing the piano just a moment ago. That's Matt. That's lovely. I love this one. Do you recognize this young boy? Would you believe he read our poem just a minute ago? Jeff Bolero. Isn't that awesome? And then we had two. Anybody have an idea on these two? Can you see them clearly? That's two redheads, Ty and Rachel, and when they were little. I like that. And then people ask me all the time, where did your kids get their musical talent from? I really don't know, except I got a guitar when I was about four years old, and so uh, that was a happy Christmas for me. And I was looking at the picture, and I also got a Batman utility belt, so that was a very, very big Christmas. Anybody remember the Batman utility belt? We were blessed that year, man. That was a wonderful, wonderful thing. Well, what I want to do is I want to share with you three words that I have been thinking about the last couple of days. And these words are not connected. They're not, they're three distinct words. But you know, when you go and you take the test to kind of see how your cognitive thinking, how you're doing and whether you're able to remember things, I want you to listen to these three words, think about them, listen to what I'm going to say. And then tomorrow morning, if you're sitting with anybody that you're with tonight, I want you to try to go over the words. See if you remember them and see if you can remember anything about them that I said. The three words are with, mystery, and movement. With, mystery, and movement. Let's start with with. With is a word that was introduced to us in the Old Testament in the person of Abraham. Let me explain. In the ancient world, people thought the gods or God was localized. If we were living in the ancient world, there would be a God or gods over Hapeville. If we went to Griffin, we would be under other gods because the Hapeville God stayed here. You understand? There was no movement. But then Abraham has a, an experience with God where God says, I want you to leave everything that you know, and I want you to travel a great distance. I'm not even going to tell you where you're going. I'm just going to lead you. But I will be with you. And that was a revelation. People didn't know that that could happen. 
God travels with us. In the New Testament, it's much more profound. Uh, Look in Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 through 23, we see Joseph has just been told that Mary is pregnant and has never known a man, and Joseph is not sure he can do this. He's not sure he can follow through on this. And this is what the angel said to him, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means, read it with me, God with us. Say those three words again, God with us. That is a powerful word, God with us. We talked about it this past Sunday. We talked about the idea of what does it mean to to talk about Jesus as the incarnate one. What does the incarnation of Jesus mean? And we said it means in Latin, embodied in flesh, deity embodied in flesh. We said in Spanish, it's incarnacion, and it means God in the meat. And that's what Christmas is. It is God putting on humanity and letting us see what it's really like. In John chapter 1, John introduced his book by saying, in the beginning was the Word. Remember, that's something divine that is spoken. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh, and he dwelt with us. One theologian said it like this, Jesus is God's sermon preached to us in the living out of a human life. And that's what Christmas is about. We get to see the Christ child living out his life as he becomes an adult. We get to see what God is really like. Jesus is the sermon. Jesus is the song. He's the story. If we want to know what God is like, we look first at Jesus because Jesus said, I am the reflection of God. And y'all, that was so revelatory too because they thought that God was was mean, that God was always exacting, that God always was against them, that they had to worry that they were going to do something wrong. And if they stepped on a crack, then maybe there was going to be lightning sent down from heaven. It was always fear. Did they sacrifice enough animals? Did they give enough tithe? Did they go to the temple enough times? And Jesus said, don't think of God like that. Think of God as loving and compassionate and much like a a beautiful heavenly Father. That's what God is like, and that God is with us, with us. I don't know what you're dealing with today. I would imagine a crowd this size, there are probably many, many things that you haven't shared with very many people. I appreciated Chelsea sharing her story. Their world has been turned upside down, but now they're sensing maybe, just maybe, Grandma's coming back. Grandma's coming back. I just know when you're in that hospital room, I can give you 100% God is with you. When you've got that issue with the boss and you're nervous and you're not sure if you're going to be able to keep your job, I want you to know something. God is with you. When you get that doctor's report about you and they use the C word and you were never expecting to hear the C word describing you and you're afraid, God is with you. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand. It doesn't mean that you won't have difficulties and troubles. Jesus said, in this life, you will have difficulties and troubles. But I want you to know through everything you ever will go through, God is with you. And that's made clear at Christmas. Emmanuel, God with us. That's the first word that I wanted you to get. Second word I want you to get is the word mystery. Neil, I don't think I have mystery on the screen, do I? I didn't get that word up there. So mystery, is it up there? There it is. Okay, mystery. That's the second word that I want you to get, mystery. There is so much about the Bible that we don't understand, and there's so much that can really baffle us and give us troubles. I want to talk just a little bit about that. We love reason and science and research and facts, 
And I think most of us are grateful that we live in the information age, but that doesn't take away that in life there is much that is shrouded in mystery. My religion started as a little 12-year-old boy in innocent faith. But as I got older, as I went to college and graduate school, it shifted into my brain. And I began to have all of these questions, things that just didn't work for me, didn't fit. It didn't make sense. And I lived a long time right here. But over the last years, I'm so glad that I have shifted again into a faith that has mystery with it. I don't understand it all. And that's okay. I believe these things for absolute sure that God loves me. I believe that God is with me. I believe that I am not just flesh and bone, but I have God inside of me. I believe that God gives me divine power for the journey that we are on. And from this life, I will leave and go to the next, but I am always with God that there's never one second that I'm not with God. God is in me and I am in God. And that doesn't make sense to many. God is in me, and yet I am in God, but I believe it is true. It is a great mystery. There certainly was a lot of mystery in the birth of Jesus, wasn't there? Angels visiting Mary, an angel visiting Joseph. The baby is conceived, but the Bible says Mary is a virgin. John the Baptist in his mother's womb, kicking when his mother Elizabeth gets near Jesus' mother Mary. Angels addressing the shepherds in a field. An old man, Simeon, and an old woman, Anna, living long enough to see the birth of Jesus. They had been promised they would see the Messiah. Wise men led to Jesus by a star. That's all pretty mystical stuff, isn't it? But I have realized if you're going to live this life and you're going to be open to God, there's mystery. There's mystery. I grew up in a church background where we pretty much thought that we knew everything. And if you had any kind of an experience that was outside of what we knew, then we just weren't so sure about you. We thought you might be crazy or something. But I have discovered that people have all kinds of experiences where they say, Ray, I'm telling you, God was there. Ray, I'm telling you, we experienced a miracle. There's no other way to say it. Ray, I am telling you, I felt something inside of me that was unbelievable. I'd never felt it before. All of those things are mysteries, but I believe it's true. I love the fact that the wise men brought their gifts, and they were from another religion, and yet they weren't persecuted. They weren't kicked out. The gifts were received warmly, and then they were sent on their way. The wise men show us, I think, that Jesus is way bigger than most people's religions because most people's religions would have had Jesus getting up as a little baby and preaching to them and trying to convert them to follow him. But they just sent them on their way, receiving the gifts, and they went back the way they had come. I don't know how to explain it, but Jesus has transformed me. Jesus has made me a better man. He has healed my heart from deep hurts. He has taught me that I don't have to live in shame. He has taken away my fear of death, which was pretty big fear of death. He is giving me confidence that I am God's child, and that is a beautiful thing. How does he do it? I have no earthly idea. It's a mystery. But at Christmas, I can embrace mystery, and you can too. At Christmas, we can embrace mystery. I want to read something that I pulled out that I thought was really good from a lady named Rachel Held Evans. Neil, if you'll run this for me, I'd appreciate it. Rachel Held Evans, she died in 2017, I believe. She was only 37, 38 years old. Wonderful Christian lady. Listen to this. She's describing something so profound. She said, it's nearly impossible to believe God shrinking down to the size of a zygote implanted in the soft lining of a woman's womb. God growing fingers and toes. God kicking and hiccuping in utero. God inching down the birth canal and entering this world covered in blood, perhaps into the steady waiting arms of a midwife. God crying out in hunger. 
God reaching for his mother's breast. God totally relaxed, eyes closed, his chubby little arms raised over his head in a pasture of complete trust. God resting in his mother's lap. God trusting God's very self totally and completely and in full bodily form to the care of a woman. God needed women for survival. Before Jesus fed us with the bread and the wine, the baby and the blood, the body and the blood, Jesus himself needed to be fed by a woman. He needed a woman to say, this is my body given for you. Women sometimes in church are put down. Read that paragraph again. God trusted God's very self totally and completely and in full bodily form to the care of a woman. God needed women for survival. Before Jesus fed us with the bread and the wine, the body and the blood, Jesus himself needed to be fed by a woman. He needed a woman to say, this is my body given for you. To understand Mary's humanity and her central role in Jesus' story is to remind ourselves of the true miracle of the incarnation. And that is the core Christian conviction that God is with us. Plain, old, ordinary us. God is with us in our fears and in our pain and in our morning sickness and in our ear infections and in our refugee crises and in our endurance of empire and in smelly barns and unimpressive backwater towns, in the labor pains of a new mother and in the cries of a tiny infant. In all of these things, God is with us and God is for us. Isn't that beautiful? Let me share one final thought. What are the three words again? With, mystery, and movement. When I say movement, I want you to understand Jesus was not put on a cross at 33 years of age because he was a really sweet, nice, good guy. He was put on a cross because everything he did was to contradict what empire said was the right way. When I say empire, I'm talking about the powers that be, those people that were in authority, Ro the Roman government. Jesus came, and when he taught, everything was, that's the empire way. This is God's way. The empire says you do it like this. I am saying this is God's way. And people began to follow him, and the people who had the authority, both in religion and in the state, they hated him because they sat in powerful places in the empire. And can I tell you something? The empire is always the enemy. Always. We can talk about us being the greatest country in the world. Yay, I'm all for that. But I want you to know there is systems in place that keep people down. There are how things are done that aren't what God wants. And Jesus expects us to kick against that and say, no, we're going to stand with the underdog. We're going to stand with those who have misfortune. We're going to stand with those who have been locked out. We're going to stand with those who have been put down. We're going to stand with the underdog. Empire goes with the, the brightest and the most powerful and the strongest. Jesus said, that's not who it is. That's why we see him with lepers and we see him with the sick and we see him with women and we see him with prostitutes and we see him with alcoholics because he is saying these are the people that are a part of the kingdom and empire hated every moment of it you know the entire christmas story is told to present jesus as the antithesis to empire do you know that jesus was called the son of god do you know who else was called the son of god caesar augustus was called the son of god you say, is that true? Look it up. That was a word description about Caesar. He was called the son of God. The followers of Jesus came along and they said, no, we have met the son of God. Herod was called king, King Herod. But Jesus' followers said, no, we follow King Jesus. That's who we are. In every way, the kingdom said it was this way, and Jesus' followers said, we will be different. We will see through different eyes, we will do different things, and we will make a difference in this world because it is better to live in the kingdom of God and understand that's where 
our citizenship is. In the kingdom of God, love is the most important principle. In Rome, power was the most important principle. In Rome, they talked about uh, the uh, Roman peace. And they had peace there because they were so militarily strong, they could just squash any rebellion. But Jesus said, that's not real peace. Jesus said, my peace I give you, my peace I leave unto you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. And so the church would say, we are living in God's kingdom and we are experiencing God's peace. And it's not the empire, it's walking in the steps of God. With God with us. Mystery. We can't explain it. Movement. That's what it's about. It's not about just saying a prayer and saying, I'm on the team. Yay, Jesus, I'm on the team. No, it's about realizing it's the way that we live our lives. Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and ever pining till he appeared and the soul found its worth. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. is the Lord. 